presentation in the sense of I'm going to hit you with a 20-30 minute lecture that has a clear beginning, middle, and end. It is much more uh, a meditation of sorts of just this is kind of what I'm thinking about, all right? I'm asked to come in and talk about this topic to you and that's one of the most interesting things to me about this class in general is I try to put myself in the same situation that all of you are in which is, and I'm speaking to the people in the Honors 350 class, right? Like you've got a project that you're working on and you're asked to think about all these things that connect to it and sometimes very directly, sometimes very indirectly. Um, but that thing that students find themselves, that situation of sort of trying to come up with a topic. And that's where I always sort of like to begin my thought process when I'm asked to do one of these. I really, really enjoy doing them every year because it's an opportunity to touch on things that don't come up in the, in the normal course of like course rotations and the classes that you teach and the work that you do at the college and all those sorts of things. So, so clearly, you know, Renaissance poetry sort of is my thing. Um, I'm willing to wager that is probably none with maybe one exception of your things, right? You've got all kinds of other different things going on. But that's one of the beauties of this class is trying to figure out how does this thing that this guy is going to talk about connect in some way no matter how loosely to what it is that i'm actually interested in and working on so we'll try to sort of come back to that at the end with that sort of so what question like what are you supposed to do with this because i highly doubt that you're going to go back to your dorms or your apartments or wherever and spend your time you know voluntarily reading renaissance poetry um, I gave you a little handout as you were coming in. We'll come back to that sort of at the end of this. So when I was presented with this topic, okay, uh, English person, come in and talk to students about presence. And the question was sort of, where do you start? And um, the first thing that sort of occurred to me was uh, I, I happened to be teaching a directed study section of a class here at Barton. It's called English 240. It's Foundations of Criticism, which is basically a bunch of isms all semester. We do a week on feminism and a week on Marxism and a week on psychoanalysis. And it's all these different sort of approaches to literary texts. And it just so happens, as I was in the process of gearing up to actually decide on what I wanted to do, that the thing that we focused on two weeks ago in this directed study was structuralism. And you're not English majors, or you know, maybe you took this class as a gen ed, but there's going to be precious few of you who did that. But structuralism just says, like, pay attention to binary oppositions. Whenever you're trying to interpret something, look out, make a conscious effort to, to identify, and then to put a little bit of pressure on binary oppositions. So then what, what is that, right? That's just two diametrically opposed things. Um, Western thought, and I would argue particularly American culture and society, uh, leverages this in, in incredible ways as we go about our daily lives, right? At a very basic level, things like night and day, and cold and hot, and young and old, male and female, right? Um, white and black, uh, free and slave, these basic sort of oppositions, looking for them when you're, when you're looking at anything, whether you're reading a text or looking at a picture, a photograph, or considering a sculpture or whatever, uh, but, but contemplate it makes sense. So I happened to be teaching this lecture on structuralism. Or, or it, it came up, it was the focus for that week was I was working with the studio and we were talking about structuralism. And so it seems like I'm cheating a little bit with my title and I actually had to run it by Dr. Lang to make sure that it was cool because everybody's coming in and talking about presence and then boom, my title is Necessary Absences. And sort of the point is that you can't consider one without considering its opposite, right? Like you can't have a conversation about blackness without also thinking about whiteness. You can't have a conversation about you know, femininity without actually taking into account masculinity. So these pairs go along with one another, right? Um, the next move beyond that then is to try to break them down, put some pressure on them, deconstruct them a little bit and say, well, what happens if we flip around the, the, the way that those things are usually handed down to us, right? Um, what does it mean if instead of privileging and valuing young over old, we just contemplate the difference that age makes on something, right? Then you get like a program like gerontology in some ways. So, so that's one thing that was on my mind. 
The other thing was just as somebody who teaches classes for a living and you're presenting me with thinking and speaking about presence, the immediate thing that comes to mind is taking role in a class, right? And that filters back to this notion of sort of binary oppositions. You were either there sitting in the seat, present and accounted for, or you were absent. There are no other gradations in there, right? You're either present or you're absent. If you're absent, we can have a conversation about whether the absent is excused or whether it's unexcused, but you can't, you know, it's like you can't be mostly pregnant, right? Like it's, it's an all or nothing thing. You're either there or you're not. And then the thing that pops into my mind were these emails and odds are over the past, you know, 12 months that you've received one of them yourself. If you have not, then your roommate has or your teammate has. If you're a teacher, you've gotten, a, you know, lots of these associated with students. But the, the thing that is bombarding our inboxes this semester is we get notification that a student has been approved for necessary absences which is the language that we have adopted this semester for when a student cannot come to class because of something related to COVID. And HIPAA prevents the administration from telling us whether this particular student actually has COVID and is in, you know, laid up in their bed in their apartment or they are in a hospital bed somewhere or merely if they're in quarantine being contact traced, right? They can't tell us, they just tell us this person has been authorized for necessary absences which means they'd be here if they could, but they can't, so try to hold them faultless in this. This is different language than we used last semester. Last semester, when one of those emails went out, it said so, such and such student has been authorized for remote learning. And then this semester, they changed it. And that's one sort of takeaway here is that language is important and words and the vocabulary and the terminology that we use for things makes a difference because this was all new to us last semester. And these emails came out and it said, so-and-so, Sheila Milne is approved for remote learning. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that I need to Zoom her into every single class that I teach? Does that mean that I need to record all of my lectures? I don't have a video camera. Should I do audio recordings? What am I supposed to do to facilitate remote learning for her? And then there was a part of, you know, expectations of the students and what they were supposed to do if they were actually just sitting in the days in and quarantine and not in a hospital bed somewhere fighting off COVID-19. This was messy. It was complicated. And so they shifted instead to this language of necessary absences. Now, the interesting thing to me, not just, you know, setting aside, uh, you know, the actual day-to-day -day business of teaching classes is it introduces gray area into this equation. What once was in a pre-COVID time, you were either present or you were absent. Now there's this murky sort of area where, well, you're on that screen back there because I'm zooming you in on a laptop. So you're kind of sort of here, but you're also not here. And teachers, since time immemorial, have also been familiar with sort of the obverse of that which is a student who is physically sitting right there in front of you, but isn't really present. You're working on stuff for other class. You're sleeping, right? Your mind is just wandering and you're daydreaming looking out the window. So on the one hand, this seems to be a very clear cut kind of a thing. You're either present or you're not, but there's all these other gradations in between where you can be physically present, but mentally absent, or you can be mentally present, but physically absent. And now it's just sort of a great big messy thing. The other thing that has been in my mind recently is, you know, we just went through the, the anniversary of 9-11. Um, we just went through the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan and all of the uh, consequences that befell as a result of that. And if you sort of just look around a culture and you try to think about things, the, the, this notion of presence versus absent, if you go and you look at the memorial that we have built for 9-11, it clearly like signals to us, there used to be two towers here, now they are no longer here. But yet they kind of are right like the holes where they stood are there if you go to the 9 11 memorial at night they turn on lights that shoot up like lasers into the sky that are a representation of where the towers used to stand so they're not there anymore but they're still sort of kind of there 
there were all of these images going around social media uh, a couple weeks ago when the helicopters in Kabul and Afghanistan and all of this and 14 US soldiers were killed. And there were all these sort of things on Instagram of restaurants reserving a table and putting 14 beers on it in honor of the 14 servicemen that lost their lives trying to evacuate out of Afghanistan. You may have experienced yourself, especially in this time of COVID, if you were lucky enough to have a graduation, right? The empty chair that's sitting there where there's student, 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 and then an empty chair so that that person that died, and it might not have been COVID, it might have been a drunk driving accident, it might have been something terrible like leukemia, it could have been anything, right? But this student that couldn't make it to graduation, but they're still here. So we do this all the time in our lives. We take that sort of apparent binary and mess with it. This is not a new thing. Um, this little blurb that I sent out said, you know, this is a, a issue that people have been meditating on and considering for as long as there have been people just about. And so in the back of our mind, I want us to, to continue thinking about these sort of seeming oppositions between being present, being absent, and the way that we use it in our culture today. But I, to, to help us sort of clarify that a little bit, I want to turn to these poems on the handout that I gave you. Just read through a few of them and see what are these people doing, right? These are all poems from the Renaissance. They're late 1590s, early 1600s. This is a much different time, right? There is no internet, there is no Zoom. There is no FaceTime. If you are physically apart from somebody, as people very often were in this culture, right? You know, like a trip from here to Raleigh takes us two hours, right? Round trip back and forth. That's at least a day, back in the day, right? To get on a horse and go on a poorly paved and maintained road and try to make that journey. Or if you don't have a horse and you have to hoof it back and forth, right? If you're gonna make an extended trip that involves a boat, you could be gone for months. So absence was, was a very significant part of people's lives. Um, and, and poets especially like to think through this in the terms of like being absent from the one that you love. Uh, which again, maybe something that's in the back of your minds uh, as students, you know, away from your homes at college, away from your loved ones, not able to go home. Like homesickness is a very real thing that pops up with students very often. So this first one here is a poem by John Hoskins, and the title of it is very straightforward, Present in Absence. And it starts off like he addresses absence as like an actual figure, as a person. Where if you're reading poetry, sometimes it says like death, like it's talking directly to the person. So it's this personification of absence here. And it says, absence, hear thou my protestation against thy strength, distance, and length. Do what thou canst for alteration, for hearts of truest metal, absence doth join, and time doth settle. So if your hearts are joined together, absence cannot part you asunder, right? Absence actually joins you together, which is this weird paradoxical sort of a notion. Who loves, it means whoever loves a mistress of such quality, his mind hath found affection's ground, beyond time, place, and all mortality. To hearts that cannot vary, absence is present, time doth tarry. And that, that notion, right? Time waits for no man. Nothing stops time except here it does. It tarries, it waits, it stops. My senses want, and want here means a lack, like do not have. My senses want their outward motion, which now within reason doth win, redoubled by her secret notion, like rich men that take pleasure in hiding more than handling treasure. So this notion that you possess something even though you don't have it right there in the palm of your hand, right? So like some rich, wealthy investor that has a billion dollars in the bank, he's not some Scrooge McDuck figure like swimming in gold coins, right? actually handling things with their senses, but they're secure in the fact that they know that it is there. By absence, this good means I gain, that I can catch her where none can watch her in some close corner of my brain. There I embrace and kiss her, and so enjoy her and none miss her. So he takes this, this 
received like binary opposition. If you were in love, is it better to be present or absent? Overwhelmingly, we would say like present, despite that old song about you know absence making the heart grow fonder or whatever, right? Like, would you rather be with your significant other or be separated by distance and time and space and what have you, right? You'd rather be together. And he takes this and flips it and says, I'd actually, I can take solace in the fact that even though we are separate from one another, I still have you in my heart. And that's actually better because when I'm when, when you're sort of on my arm and we're out in public and other men are looking at you and I have to sort of share you with the world, when I have you in my mind, when I have you in, you, in my heart, you belong to me and to me alone. So sort of the point here is just somebody taking these two ideas that seem oppositional, presence, absence, and collapses them into one thing and says it's possible for somebody to be present even though they're absent, right? The next one, William Shakespeare. Uh, so this is one of his sonnets. Same sort of setup is his, the, the person that he loves is physically removed from him, has gone on a trip somewhere. This one's a little bit different. He says, betwixt mine eye and heart, a league is took. So that, uh, there's a great distance between my eye and my heart. I'm thinking about you, my love is with you, even though I can't physically see you right now because you're miles down the road. Betwixt mine eye and heart a league is took, and each doth good turns now unto the other. When that mine eye is famished for a look, or heart in love with sighs himself doth smother, with my love's picture then my eye doth feast, and to the painted banquet bids my heart. Another time mine eye is my heart's guest, and in his thoughts of love doth share a part. So I got a little picture of you. Like I imagine in my head when I'm reading this poem, like Shakespeare's sitting there, with a, or the speaker of the poem is sitting there like with a locket, with a picture of the beloved in it, right? So even though you're gone, you're still right here in the palm of my hand. So even though I can't see you, I can see you. But even if I can't see you, my heart is still with you. So either by thy picture or my love, thyself away art present still with me. For thou not farther than my thoughts canst move, and I am still with them and they with thee. Or if they sleep, thy picture in my sight awakes my heart to hearts and eyes delight. And even when I'm sleeping, I can still see you because I'm dreaming about you, right? So one way or another, even though you're not standing here right beside me, I can either have this sort of this representation of you in this picture, or my heart is there where you are. And again, the point here is that he takes this notion of presence and absence, which seem to be mutually exclusive categories, and collapses them down into one thing. The last poem is actually my favorite poet. Uh, a poet by the name of John Donne, who's contemporary of all these other people. And he wrote this poem, A Valediction for Bidding Mourning. And this one's a little more dense and complicated because it's not just an easy to digest relatively, you know, sonnet like the other ones are. So first stanza, it says, As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say, the breath goes now, and some say no. So like an old, pious person who's made his peace with God and is expiring, right? This isn't somebody that rage, rage against the dying of the light kind of thing. I'm ready to go, right? I'm ready to go on up to heaven. My soul is secure and they just pass away. And he's using this as a metaphor for parting and he's talking about his wife here, right? So he's, he has to go on a trip and he's leaving his wife behind. And the metaphor that he uses for this is like, let's not make a big scene. It's kind of a weird metaphor. That's how done traffic's, right? Like an old person dying who who isn't mourning the loss of life, but is rejoicing and passing on to heaven, that's how we should part from one another. That's the first thing. So, like all of that, let us melt and make no noise, no tear floods, nor sigh tempests move, to a profanation of our joys to tell the laity of our love. Again, we don't have to make a big scene. We don't have to show everybody else who's around, you know, how distressed we're gonna be. We know how much we love one another. We'll just take our leave and part. 
It says, moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Earthquakes are bad. Men reckon what it did and meant, because earthquakes were very often signs, right? That something bad was going to happen in the human realm, right? That the gods are angry or what have you. The trepidation of the spheres, though great or far, is innocent. Dull, sublunary lovers love, whose soul is sense. Again, you get that like undergirding uh, uh, binary between mind and body, right? But not like all these other people that their bodies are in love. That's what he's saying here. Dull, sublunary lovers love, whose soul is sense, like not common sense, like your senses, hearing and tasting and smelling and vision and touching. These people cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it. If all you care about is your beloved's face and her breath and her voice and this and that, you can't stand to be apart from her because all the things that you love about her aren't there anymore. But what we have, and this is lurking in the background of the poem, but what these people have is realer than that. It's deeper than that. It's not grounded on a mere physical attraction or physical sensations. It's a spiritual sort of love that they have. But we, by love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is, enter assured of the mind, care less eyes, lips, and hands to miss. So we're not like those other people. And then this is the part that's really of most interest to me. Our two souls, therefore, which are one, because they're married, right? Flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, they're united as one person in matrimony. Our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not yet a breach. There's not a break that's happening here, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. It's like if you've got a little piece of gold and you recognize that, like, the point on this end has to go to the back of the room back there, and the point on this end has to stay right here. So one option would be to like get some tin snips, cut it in half, and take half of it back there and half of it right here. That's a breach. He comes up with an alternative. Instead of either being present or absent, he says what we could do is take that piece of gold, and if you hammer it hard enough and long enough, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and it will stretch out. And even though one piece is back there at the back of the room and one piece is up here, or one, one point of the piece of gold, they're still connected to one another, right? But you can stretch it out. And this is a weird metaphor, but a very interesting one that he's using for distance, for separation, for absence. And then my favorite stanza. It says, if they be two. So if you're, if you're not buying that, that we're actually one person. If we're actually two, they are two so as stiff twin compasses are two. And he doesn't mean like a north, south, east, west compass. He means like a, a, the thing you had in elementary school that you like stab your friend with if you're gonna draw a circle with something. You put the little golf pencil in it, right? That's what he's talking about here. He says, if we're two, we're like a mathematical compass. And thy soul, the fixed foot, the part, the little stabby part, makes no show to move, but doth of the other two. So if we're two things, we're not two things, we are two things joined together. And as one moves, so does the other one. And though you, because the wife is being left behind while he has to go on his business trip, basically. He says, and though it in the center sit, Yet when the other far doth roam, it doesn't matter if you're drawing a little tiny circle or a great big long one, right? It leans and hearkens after it and grows erect as that comes home. Such wilt thou be to me who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Thy firmness makes my circle just and makes me end where I've begun. So even though I have to go away, I'm directly connected to you and I'm always going to come home to you. And it's always going to draw this sort of perfect circle because of, of your steadfastness, of your constancy, that you were there, I'm going to come back home to you, right? I'm not going out to get milk from the store and back cigarettes and never coming home. This is a round trip. This is a fascinating, bizarre way of trying to express love and companionship and unity in a marriage, right? 
So going back to the beginning of this thing, what does this have to do with you? Who are working on a, a variety of different things, or if you're not even in the class and you're just gonna walk out the door and go back to your normal life and never think about John Donner, or Shakespeare, or John Hoskins ever again. My encouragement would be to think about whatever it is that you're dealing with, these binaries that seem to exist in your life, that seem to be, you must choose this or that. Very often that's not the case, right? That the actual much more valuable way of approaching this is looking for ways where instead of either or, it's like and. Silly example, it's actually not that silly, but um, we like to think about, you know, use language in higher education of student hyphen athlete. You're not just one or the other, you're both. And trying to find a way in which you can be successful in the classroom and on the athletic field, not fail all your classes, but win the Heisman Trophy, right? Not bat .001 for the season, but get A's in all of your classes, like trying to find a way to walk the middle of that thing. So, so in our lives, in our work, in our studies, my, my sentiment to you would be to just try to think, even if it's not about presence and absence, but about this notion of binaries and where it seems to be you only have two choices, right? We're especially guilty of this in this country because we have a culture because of advertising and capitalism in our economy. Like, which one do you like, Coke or Pepsi, right? Which fandom do you fall into? Are you Star Trek or Star Wars? Like you have to pick one. You can't ever say I enjoy both. Are you Democrat or Republican, right? How about we just think about there are Americans in a variety of different positions on the political spectrum instead of rah, rah, go team R or go team D. And my hope, my argument would be that we would be a much better sort of society and group of people if we could do this more.